All right. Okay, so what this um, session is going to be, it's kind of a last minute decision on, on my end is we are going to do um, open ended review for our tests on Friday. Um, the reason for this is I was looking at the folders and I noticed that the folder for today is what we actually did on Monday. Um, so no need to really get ahead of ourselves when we have a test on Friday that we can just review for um, instead. So just some uh, quick things I have for the test one. All right, so Friday opens up at 12 a.m. and you have a, until 11.59 p.m. to take it. I would highly suggest that you don't try to take it or try to start after 11. Um, just because it, it might take, usually it only takes a couple minutes to get into the test. But in case there are some, some issues with you uh, accessing the test, uh, you want to give yourself some time to figure out those issues. Uh, speaking of which, the practice test, in quotes, that I put up on um, yesterday, do try and take that, please. Because all that is, it's really just to see if your system is ready to go with the ProctorU uh, uh, plugin. Right. So it's not really a test in that it has knowledge or has the information I'm looking for in the test. It's just to make sure we work out any bugs relating to ProctorU. Um, so I'm giving extra credit for you to just go and test your system out before Friday. So make sure you do that. Um, please, I cannot stress that enough to do that. Um, because you don't want to try and log in on Friday and it not work, and then you're panicking to contact me because you're running out of time to take the test. Uh, so let's get rid of all those potential problems uh, before Friday. Um, the test itself, you have 60 minutes. Um, combination of multiple choice and short answer. Um, all the questions will be shown at once in a random order. Um, yeah, so let me open up the floor. Does anyone have any questions about the test? Or is there any material people were going over studying that they weren't sure on, uh, wanted me to go over again? Anything at all. I am open to any single question uh, relating to the test or anything right now. Will we be able to skip and go back questions? So everything's shown at once, right? So you can just scroll. You can or an, uh, short answer, answer them in any order that you want. You don't know how to start question eight on on the practice test. I'm guessing that's one I have up on Blackboard is what you're referring to. Let me. Yes. Okay. Let me open up Blackboard then. as you can hear me furiously typing away on my keyboard. Test fall 2019, test one. What is question eight? Ah, ha ha. 
This is a question that I thought I was oh so clever when making. And this might be one of my favorite questions I have ever made. All right. I have a solution that contains 50% protonated aspartic acid and 50% unprotonated aspartic acid. What must be the pH of my solution? All right. We just made a buffer, right? So remember a buffer is made out of base and conjugate acid. And the difference between our conjugate pairs, that's what these are called, is a hydrogen. So if two molecules are just different by one hydrogen, they are conjugate pairs, right? Okay, so our equation for a buffer is Henderson-Hasselbalch, pH equals pKa plus log base over acid. And if the solution is 50% base and 50% acid, that means the base, so I'm, I'll just put in 50 and 50. So, base is 50, acid is 50, 50 divided by 50 is one. The log of one, when you do log of one, that's equal to zero. So this question is pH equals pK. So it's a fancy way of me combining two things. One, do you, well, multiple things on this question. One, do you know what a buffer is? you know it's made out of conjugate pairs? Two, do you know the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation for a buffer? Yeah, if you do that. Three, do you know the pKa of aspartic acid? So the answer for uh, this is the pKa of aspartic acid, 3.75, something like that. Uh, have you mentioned how much your extra credit are worth? Um, it's probably be like a percentage. I mean, it's not going to be anything huge, but at the same time, I'm not asking you to do much for it. So I think a percentage is, is fair for making sure your system works uh, for the test. Well, you have an equation sheet. Uh, yes. Yes, you will have an equation sheet. So I can put that up. Thought I already did, but apparently I didn't. So yes, I'll give you an equation sheet for uh, uh, test one. And you're gonna have that printed out uh, with you with uh, blank pieces of paper. Huh. Question nine goes right with question eight. The solution in question eight we made is called a buffer. It, compared, it consists of conjugate pairs. Any other questions? Any material? Any questions relating to anything at all? I'm willing to field those questions. You wanna go over examples? We can go over examples. Question 12, why wouldn't it cut near the methyl group? So question, why am I going to 20? Question 12 has to do with, uh, let me get it so it's only one page at a time. Question 12, you are working with the restriction endonuclease ECO-R1. ECO-R1 cuts at GAA TTC between the G and the A. So um, for every restriction endonuclease that's ever been found, there's a, another enzyme called a methylase. What a methylase does, so like, for example, let me back up. So ECO-R1 
is found in E. coli, R strain. So in that uh, strain of E. coli, there's also a methylase that corresponds to E. coli R1. The idea is a methylase will go and methylate the host organism's DNA at that restriction enzyme site. Because if an organism did not have this methyl group here and they created this endonuclease, they would cut their own DNA, which would kill the organism. So to prevent the organism from cutting itself, the methylase puts a methyl group in the recognition sequence and the endonuclease cannot cut anything that has a methyl on it. So um, GAA, so, and also five prime, three prime. So we're looking and we're looking for anywhere GAA TTC happens without a methyl group. So right here, right here, that's, that's your cuts. But yeah, it, you can't cut if there's methylated DNA. That's the short answer. If I ask you a question on restriction endonuclease, um, I will give you what it cuts, yes. You don't have to memorize that tape. You have to know what it does. You have to know that it reads five prime to three prime, all that good stuff. But um, like you, I would never ask a question of eco R1, what is his recognition sequence? That's something you can always look up. All right, well, I'll slowly make my way down this practice uh, test unless people have other questions. And if you want me to go over something that you're seeing, uh, feel free to stop me. Remember, uh, if you haven't taken this, this test yet, um, it's, it's a good way to uh, just test yourself since I gave this two years ago now. So just basic stuff we've learned about in lecture one. Hydrophobic effect. One thing that drives me crazy, never say that uh, nonpolar molecules are afraid of water. Nonpolar molecules don't care. They don't interact with anything. Uh, it's the remember, it's the water that does not want to interact with the nonpolar molecules. Make sure you know what's a hydrogen bond. They're very important in biochemistry. Make sure you know your amino acids. Full name, three letter code, one letter code, PKAs. There's like three questions that I just asked those things like, what's the name of this amino acid? What's the three letter code? What's the one letter code? Does it have a PKA? So guarantee that's gonna be on there. We have our basics about uh, catalysts here, buffers we just talked about. Um, talked about this question in class, how, um, DNA has two forces acting on it, negative repulsion, wanting to pull the strands apart, and hydrogen bonds wanting to make the strands come together. So said this also in class, but I would not, I can't have you draw anything. Uh, do be ready to recognize though. I'm gonna give you a molecule made out of these parts and just ask you, what is this molecule being shown? Again, that's another patented Dr. Andrews, 100% guarantee gonna be on your test. Make sure you know and recognize your nucleotides. Restriction endonucleases, Sanger DNA sequencing. We talked about that uh, right before the blizzard hit. On a plasma, we talked about those. Also talked about PCR. Protein backbone. This seems, I got that question a lot. Um, 
when I when I gave this test in person. Uh, remember the protein backbone. When I say that, I mean N N termini or NH three plus carbon alpha C termini C O O minus. That's what the backbone of a protein or amino acid is. Hey, look, it's naming amino acids. Guarantee I'm going to have a problem like this as well, where I give you a peptide, you tell me the charge is at 1714. Guarantee that's going to be on there, so make sure you know how to do all of those. And then a question about isotonic, hypertonic. No questions here. So what do you got for me? What do you want to know? Through that little brief, brief going through. Number seven on study guide four. Okay, let me open that up. Study guide four. Okay, let me share that. Inside the cell, if you have 22% A, how much C, T, and G do you have? Yeah. So, Whoops, helping my pen's right way. So remember A equals T, C equals G, right? So if I have 22% A, I have 22% T. So that makes up 44%. And I have C equals G, that makes up the rest. So if, uh, if I have 100% DNA and 44% of that is A and T, therefore the amount of C and G is 56%, 100 minus 44. And since C equals G, to find out the individual amounts, I just divide that by two. So I have 28% C, 28% G. So that is... Uh, number seven on study guide four. That was the right question, right? He said it was 25. Uh, I trust what I did now than the key. Very possible. I, I did some miscalculations there. Yeah, that's that's definitely yeah, twenty five percent is not right at all. I will change that right now and save it. Yeah. Just looking at this, what does ADP glucose do in the cell? Did I? I, thought, I think that is not supposed to be there. I don't think we talked about ATP glucose yet. Unless I'm misremembering the order of stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, question six is, I think that's for biochem too. Wait. We have not talked about ADP glucose in this class yet. Okay, what else do you got for me though? Anything else going through the study guides, the in-class tests um, that you weren't sure of? Or, I mean, if there's no questions, what I'll do is I'll just go through our various PowerPoints again, and maybe I'll jog your memory of like what's on there. But if you do have specific questions, please feel free to stop me at any any point here. Let's have a new setup. Yeah. So remember our functional groups, as you saw in the practice test, I, I will ask you, a, it's just a simple question, right? Show you a picture, ask you what it is. Um, so make sure you just know our basic functional groups here. Um, and since I get asked this, these questions we do in class are a good way to test yourself and kind of similar to questions you'll get in class. So the practice tests on proctor use mulch, you just see if our setup is good. Yeah, so the, the that test I put up there, there's no questions related to biochem on it. It's simply there to see, like, does your computer work before the real test? Um, so yeah, that's all it is. The practice test is the paper, it's the Word document that we are looking at. Uh, so classes, just our, our basic classes of uh, biomolecules. Do we need a calculator for the test? Um, I would have one. I don't remember if I asked a calculator question, but I might. So I, I would have one available. differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So nothing too great here, just, just the big differences. Uh, same with that. Basic, the basics of evolution, the basics of enthalpy and entropy. Again, we're not going into any of these topics in great detail here in our first, first slide. Um, so if you can answer the questions on, on, on PowerPoint one, uh, that's all the depth we're going to go into. Computer. Equilibrium, the basic, like I said, I, I will give you a document that has the equations on it um, that you can print out and use. I just ask that you don't have anything written on it before the test starts. Basics of enzyme, hydrogen bonds, big idea. Uh, hydrophobic effects. Solubility based on the hydrophobic effect, difference between hyper iso and hypotonic. That's all there was for uh, PowerPoint 2. Again, feel free to stop me at any time if you want to go over something more in depth.
or if you have like questions from now until Friday, always feel, don't ever hesitate to contact me. I know I seem like the scariest professor there is. I don't think I'm scary, but other people apparently think I'm scary. Um, Can you do another question like question 12 from the practice exam? Sure. Let me fold the practice exam. Uh, one with endonucleases. Okay. Uh, so the study guides and PowerPoints will be more similar to the exam than the homework we did on Wiley, or should we study uh, Wiley homework as well? So your priority um, should be, in my opinion, is look over the stuff we did on the PowerPoints. Make sure you can answer those questions that we did in the PowerPoints and try to answer those without any notes. Try also to do that with the study guides. So go back to the study guides and do your best to fill that out without any notes. Try not to have a single PowerPoint open when you answer those questions on the study guide. I'll focus on those. The Wiley Plus homework is more of a way as a review uh, through the week. Um, and it's still good. I would go back and try those as well um, because it's all relevant. It still contains the topics we're going over, um, but but with a limited amount of time, I would save that for last. So, I guess I would probably do like in class PowerPoints, uh, do those problems without looking at the information, study guides, do that without looking at the information. Go to the practice test, see if you can ace that, and then go to Wiley Plus if you're still looking for things to do. Um, so can I do another question like 12? I don't know, because these questions are really hard to do on the fly. Um, okay, let's say there is a new restrictional endonuclease nucleus called, I don't know, B34. And B34 cuts A, A, T, C. It cuts between the A and the T. Actually, that's a bad example. Um, it can't cut between there, sorry. It cuts between uh, E, C, G. Okay, it cuts between A, C, G, T. It cuts between the C and the G. Based on this sequence right here, what would we cut, right? And the only thing to really keep in mind for that is when looking for this sequence, we can only cut, first you have to read the DNA, five prime to three prime in both directions. So if you would find an ATC, a ACGT going the reverse way, it doesn't cut there. It has to be going the right way. Also, there cannot be a methyl group on either A, C, G, or T. So when we do that, we find all oh, ACGT here. I'm gonna cut here. Then you go in the reverse route. And the thing about uh, restriction endonucleases and the reason why I had to take a second there and figure out what the sequence of this fake endonuclease is, they only cut in palindromes. So if it's ACTG on one strand, the other strand going five prime to three prime is ACGT. That's a C, not a G. So, 
palindromes. And so ACGT cut right here. We just made blunt ends because I'm cutting in the center of my sequence. So just to confirm, but you said there cannot be a methyl group attached to the sequence uh, that the restriction on nucleus may cut. Right. Um, in the recognition sequence, right? So for the B34, if there's a methyl on the A, C, G, or T, the endonuclease skips it. It can't work. Um, that's why in uh, the real problem for this with ECOR1, where we're looking at GAATTC, uh, there's a methyl on this A right here. So I have to skip that sequence because I can't cut it. And so that's why I cut at the other GAATTC. And in that cut, we are making, so here's a sticky end. And this one is a blunt end. All right. What else? What other questions you got for me? Now we can just go back to like scrolling through the PowerPoint slowly and I'll just do some random comments. You can do that as well. And if you see anything there, you can stop me. So S's and bases, we talked a little bit about this already when we looked at, at the practice exam. Um, so know what a conjugate pair means. Like we said, it's just different by one hydrogen. Um, know the, well, know how to use the KW equation. Again, I will give you that equation. Just know how to use it. Know what pH means. Um, so no R, this is a question like you could need a calculator for. I actually don't remember if I gave you this or not, um, uh, but be prepared to do a question like question two, just in case. Now what the Henderson Hasselbach equation is used for, used for buffers. Um, again, some more, uh, buffer calculation questions. So again, this may show up. more questions about buffers. So pretty short slideshow there, but pretty dense when it comes to math. Um, so your buffer uh, problems um, would be your mat most math intensive when it comes to test one. Again, we talked about this when looking over our practice test, but make sure, like I said here, you know how to recognize the basis. You don't have to draw them for this semester. Make sure the name, nucleotides, when I add phosphates on it, either a triphosphate, diphosphate, monophosphate. Uh, no, it goes five prime to three prime. And again, here's like good practice. Basically, know the basic features of a double helix, right? Uh, you saw I already answered or asked one of these questions um, on the practice test, uh, 3B. So I could ask like, 
Um, hopefully that shows you that sometimes I just get lazy and like to just re-ask the question I asked in the lecture and see if people were paying attention and studied. Um, so that's not out of the question that I'll do that here. Just copy and paste. Do you remember when we talked about this or did you go and review your notes about this question? So I can't reiterate enough, make sure you know how to do those questions. Semi-conservative, central dogma for biology, DNA, RNA, protein, uh, replication, transcription, translation. We already did like a question like this on the practice test uh, using Shargaff's rule, A equals T, C equals G. And that's, that's it for this PowerPoint. So again, if, any, if you see a slide where you're like, I don't remember that, or I'm not sure how to do that, uh, feel free to just say, uh, could we go over that more in depth? Otherwise, I'm going to keep on jamming through our PowerPoints until someone does stop me. Restriction on nucleases, talked about this. Um, we want to use type 2 because they cut at our recognition site. Type 1 does not. Uh, blunt end versus sticky end, basically just where are you cutting? Are you cutting in the middle of the sequence, like of your recognition sequence, like eco RV or R5 rather? Then that is uh, blunt. Eco R2 is also blunt because it's right at the beginning. So if you cut at the beginning, the end or the middle, that's blunt end. If you make an uneven cut, that's called a sticky end. Sequencing DNA, the Sanger sequencing. Again, this is a question that uh, showed up on the practice exam. So hopefully when you looked at the practice exam, uh, if you didn't know, you went back to this slide to show how our sequencing works. The major molecule for this is our uh, double or our dideoxynucleotide rather because we can't add anything to it. And here's just a sequence. Don't worry, I'm not gonna give you something like this huge and ask you to read it and do something like this. I might do it for like a smaller version, but I won't give you something that's like 100 nucleotides. That would take up way too much time. And then make sure you know the basics of how our next gen sequencing works. Just the overall, uh, differences between pyro and alumina sequencing when it comes down, like, if you can explain these pictures to me, that's all I'm asking for you to do. Like, imagine I sit in a room and I say, alumina sequencing, explain it to me. And if you just recite what's going on in these pictures, you're, you're, that's good enough. I won't ask you to do this. It's a fun exercise, but I'm not going to actually give you a sequence and have you reorder it like a puzzle. And then human genome sequence. Um, I'm not going to ask you, what is the question on here? Uh, I'm not going to ask you about gene like density. Um, what would I ask you on this? Yeah, I probably won't ask you any of the numbers. So don't worry about memorizing that. Um, I guess the important thing from here is that, uh, is that um, there's a lot of, no, I found, sorry, I found thought about, is that there's a lot of similarities between uh, uh, different organisms in that it doesn't change, need that much DNA to be changed. And also proteins make up a very small portion of the genome. Oh, there are chats. They weren't popping up. Uh, which PowerPoint was that one? This last one was uh, PowerPoint 5 to 1. Do we know you need to know the differences between steps in each sequencing method? Yeah, um, basically what's the difference between the two? You can't see the PowerPoint. Yay, technology. No wonder I couldn't see any of the chats because I wasn't doing it right. 
All right. Can you see it now? Yeah, it was just this. So, recap. Chain terminator sequencing method. When I was talking about this image, I was I was pointing to this, right? No pyro sequencing, Illumina sequencing. Like, ex be able to explain these images to me. I'm sure, that makes a lot more sense now that you can see the images than me just saying this image. And when I was talking about like I don't know what to ask you on this, it was this image, right? Um, where I was saying, eh, now that I think about it. It would probably be that proteins make up a small percentage and the difference between organisms is relatively small. Um, but I won't ask you to memorize like these numbers in any depth. I'm sure that all makes a lot more sense now. Wait. Could you go over question five on study guide five? Sure can. Uh, let me share that. So what will you get when you mix this sequence with TAC1? So here on the study guide, I didn't give you what TAC1 does. Um, because you had access to it, but on the test I would. So TAC1 cuts at uh, TCGA. So TAC1 cuts here. So five prime to three prime TCGA, right? Cut. Five prime to three prime TCGA, cut. That's not a very good line, but I'm cutting between the T and the C. So the product would be five prime, A, C, G, T, because I made a cut there, that's the end of that sequence, three prime. And then my other five, one of my other sequences would be the continuation of that five prime, C, G, A, A, T, C, three prime. And then I have to do my cuts down here where I cut between uh, let me erase that because that was a really bad cut. I, I cut from the T to C here. So basically now this bottom strand has been separated. So um, actually, let me do it five prime, three prime. Five prime, so I'm going this way. It will be G, A, T, T. That's where my cut is. So that's the new three prime end. Then I continue from here, five prime, C, G, A, C, G, T, three prime. So every time you make a cut, you just get a new end. And it's either five prime or three prime based on what direction you're going, right? So five prime must end in a three prime. Start again, five prime must end in a three prime. So about five minutes left. Get those questions in now. This one is easier because there is no methyl. That is correct. I mean, the, if I was going to say, OK, what's the, what's the products? And I put a methyl here, right? And then you would say no cut. While conversely, just to make sure we're all clear on that point, if I put a methyl here, and I guess it would uh, ACGT. Okay, so let's say there was a methyl there for some reason, you would still cut because it, it only matters if it's in the recognition sequence. So if there's no methyl here, I still cut. 
right? I don't care there's a methyl on the C over here. So the methyl has to be in, in what you're looking for. What else? As I draw stars. So the answer will be five, no. Um, let me get off my stars. If I gave you that methyl, right, the answer would be this. The only difference is that this has a methyl on it. Because what, what a methyl group does in context of a restriction endonuclease is if the methyl group is in your recognition sequence, it doesn't cut. If it's not, it doesn't do anything. So if I put the methyl there on that C, it doesn't do anything because it's the, the enzyme doesn't see it. Anything else? Well, there is nothing else. Um, what I would say is that if you do think of something between now and Friday, feel free to email me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. If you want to have a talking session by a Zoom one-on-one, -on -one, you know it's intimidating. You can keep your camera off if you want. You can hide, that's fine. Uh, we can have one of those. Um, Otherwise, make sure you, you do the Proctor U practice setup before Friday. Um, it's much better to get that out of the way now until on set away until Friday when you try to do the real thing and then you're panicking because oh no, time's running out and it doesn't work. Um, so I'm trying to help you prevent that. Otherwise, study hard. Good luck, everybody. Um, I don't think it'll be too bad. Usually you all do much better than my Gen Chem 1 students and test 1. So I have faith in you. Um, otherwise, I will see people Monday if you don't want to talk to me before then. Rest up, eat well, exercise. Don't forget to do those. They will all help you in addition to studying. Take breaks, go for walks. Albert Einstein did his best thinking while on walks because your brain frees up while your body's in motion. Don't have the TV on while you study. Humans are garbage at multitasking. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. We can't multitask, we're not good at it. Um, yeah, other than that, I have nothing for you. So I will see people on Monday, hopefully. Take care.